Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third episode of A Gal's In Your Corner. I'm your host, Mark Tewksbury. I like to say that I won the Olympics in Barcelona, and I won the first World Out Games 100-meter backstroke in Montreal in 2006. So I've really uh, known both sides of the LGBTQ2IS sport world. Um, I, I would like to um, welcome you back to the third episode, obviously. Um, I have also believe in inclusion in sport. I've seen that sport can be transformative, both for me personally, as part of this community, but also as past chair of Special Olympics. Um, we have a really fascinating show today. Um, EGAL Virtual Roundtable, this, this show is really a, sports is a digital space where we can come together and really look at issues that are impacting us during this kind of uh, uncharted territory during COVID-19. How are we practicing sport? How are these times impacting sport in general? Tonight, we have a really interesting episode that looks at LGBTQI2S regulation in sport. And we're going to do that by looking at a very specific case, Castor Semenaya, who I'm sure many of you have heard of, but we're, if you haven't, don't worry, we're going to get some background tonight because we have some really fascinating guests. Um, I'm just going to get them right onto the show because they're going to help educate us and, and really drive this program tonight. So first up, we have Carlos Sayo. As a former competitive swimmer who represented Canada at the World Championships and Commonwealth Games, Carlos brings to bear his passion for sport and representing athletes and sport organizations in complex disputes. He's appeared before the Court of Arbitration for Sport on multiple occasions, including representing South African Olympic champion Castor Semenaya in a landmark case challenging a regulation that requires certain women to lower their naturally occurring testosterone levels as a condition of participation in women's sport. I have a great affinity for Carlos because he was a national team member swimmer. Let's <laughs> welcome Carlos. Welcome, Carlos. Hi. Good evening, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here tonight. Wonderful. Well, I'll get to you in a second, Carlos. I'm going to introduce our next great guest, which is Alison Sandmeyer Graves. And Alison is the CEO of Canadian Women and Sport, the leading voice and authority on women and sport in Canada. The organization works to create systemic change to expand equity and inclusion at all levels of sport and physical activity. In her role, Allison works closely to advance progress on this topic with leaders from coast to coast and across sectors. By harnessing leading research, guiding policy and practice, and partnering on solutions, Canadian Women and Sport is helping to drive better sport through gender equity. Um, Allison has a BN Political Sci from the University of Alberta, a Master's in International Development Studies from Dalhousie, a big passion for social justice, and we're happy to have her here. Let's welcome Allison. <laughs> welcome. Hello. Okay, I'm on the first unmuting. Hello. <laughs> Very happy to be here. You just have to get that first one under your belt. Now it's there done. No worries at all. So, wow, Carlos, I just have to say on a human level, what a huge thing it must be to take a case to that high level of arbitration court in sport. Um, what is that like for you? Yeah, well, it's um, it's profound. I mean, having been uh, an athlete competing at a pretty high level in swimming myself, um, to be able to go to the highest court in the world and advocate essentially for athletes' rights. And in the case of Castro Semenya and, and um, an athlete called Duty Chand who came before her, um, it's advocating for athletes' most fundamental human rights. So um, it's a deeply profound experience, and it's certainly one of the highlights of, uh, of my professional career, that's for sure. So Castor really, um, I guess, came onto the scene in 2009 with a, uh, winning the World Championships. And since then has really faced an interesting journey. I guess interesting isn't the best word to use, but it, it's been a, a very tumultuous journey with the IOC and the IAAF since almost that first medal. So can you take us back to sort of a little bit of the history to set the stage, Carlos, for, for what's happened? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think really the, the history starts on this issue even before Castor, well before Castor. Um, you know, since the 1960s, uh, international sports bodies have been regulating women and women's appearances and women's biology. So it started back in the 60s with the so-called nude parades where women athletes at the Olympics would be asked to essentially strip down 
uh, in front of uh, male doctors and they would have their most intimate uh, uh, physical uh, characteristics challenged and inspected. Um, and only if they were deemed to be feminine enough they would they receive their femininity certificate and be allowed to compete in women's sports. So the, the issue of sex testing in sport is one that's not new by any stretch of the imagination. But just going back to, to Castor's experience, um, you're right, Mark, it started when she sort of exploded onto the international scene at the Berlin uh, I, IAAF, which is now known as World Athletics, uh, the World Championships, and she won gold at that event. Um, and in what should have been sort of a, a moment of intense pride and personal achievement, um, instead, uh, it was a very, very difficult moment for her because right before the finals of that event, um, there had been a, uh, there was a leak to the media that uh, Castor had been subjected to uh, a gender verification test. And so, um, you know, reporters and the public were questioning the most physical, uh, intimate details of her biology and her gender. Um, and instead of being able to celebrate that moment, she um, essentially was uh, under intense scrutiny. And from that point, and at, and at that event, I should add, um, you know, even officials from World Athletics made very troubling comments, like um, the director general of the IAAF said something to the effect of, well, Castor is a woman, but maybe not 100%. So extremely damaging um, and really harmful comments that, you know, profoundly affected her. And then from, from that point onward, um, you know, she essentially uh, was required um, to take hormone reducing medications from 2010 to about 2014 as a condition of eligibility to compete um, in women's sport. Um, and those medications made her feel uh, extremely sick. Um, she lost her mental focus and she was um, you know, profoundly affected uh, by those medications. And then fast forwarding um, to uh, 2015, when um, another athlete, Judy Chand, was successful at the Court of Arbitration for Sport in essentially overturning um, these regulations that apply to Castor and other women. Um, so Castor was able to run free at that point, uh, and she won gold at the Rio Olympics um, in an amazing performance. But then uh, World Athletics turned around and imposed brand new regulations in 2018, which again were applied um, in the events that Castor competed in. And so those were the um, regulations that she challenged uh, before the Court of Arbitration for Sport. Um, and uh, in a very controversial uh, and split decision, uh, the arbitrators um, ruled that those regulations were discriminatory, but that they were justified uh, in the interests of fair sport. Um, and then the last stage, or the most current stage of her sort of legal battle has been, um, unfortunately, an unsuccessful appeal to the Swiss Supreme Court. It's a particularity of international uh, sports arbitration that those decisions are reviewed uh, in Switzerland. And here, the Swiss Supreme Court basically found that, among other things, the, the regulations um, violated uh, Castor and other women subjected to them, their most fundamental human rights including uh, their right to physical integrity and their right to economic freedom. But again, the court found that those violations were justified in the interests of fair sport. So that's where we're at today. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's other legal avenues that can be pursued um, and uh, Castor and her team are, all, are considering all options, but she maintains that she's not gonna take uh, any of these harmful medications um, anymore and she's actually uh, changed her events to the 200 meters, which is now what she's focused on, because that's one of the events that is not regulated. So that's her focus for Tokyo 21. So Alison, just um, so thank you, Carlos, for for that great background and history, and and so true that you know this is really gone for so many decades. I remember being an Olympian in the 1980s and, and women having to go at that time to do the gender verification test. Allison, this has been an issue for women in sport beyond just caster and, and uh, recent issues for a long time. Certainly it has, and there's, there's a larger picture to all of this as well that I'd love to touch on. First, let me say that Canadian Women in Sport, alongside with the Canadian Centre for Ethics in Sport and Athletes Can, which represents national team athletes here in Canada, have all come out in opposition 
to the, the CAS rulings and, and certainly will we'll do so with the Swiss ruling as well. And firmly believe that Castor should be able to compete as a woman without altering her natural hormones mentally or mentally, medically, medically. Um, so this is a discussion of many things, but this is uh, very much a discussion about women's sport. And those who agree with the, that with these rulings, as you heard, are saying that it's a matter of fairness, that um, women like Castor have an unfair advantage and it, it undermines the integrity of the competition. <laughs> Effectively, they're saying that women who don't have this biological advantage are can't compete and win. And they also say that it's category breaking so that is a really important thing for us to look at because at the root of this is effectively the ceilings that have been imposed on women's sport using science that is very scrutinized and debated still that says basically women can only perform to this level at which point it seemed to be uh, entering into the men's space and also the policing uh, of gender which ultimately looks a lot like scrutinizing women's appearances and anybody who doesn't fit into a certain norm of femininity becomes suspect and becomes subjected to all kinds of harmful scrutiny, very public scrutiny, as you've seen in, in Castor's case as well, um, and medical scrutiny as well, which we would consider incredibly harmful, incredibly damaging, and ultimately harmful, not just to those who are being subjected to it, but to all women's uh, participating in sport. Carlos, do you want to jump in there? Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more with, with Allison. Um, you know, I think this notion of fairness in sport is one that we need to um, be quite careful with. Uh, you know, the, the evidence um, is that women who are affected by these regulations are predominantly from um, developing countries. They're predominantly black and brown women from the global south. Um, you know, Duty Chan, who's an athlete that we represented um, and was successful at the CAS uh, in challenging the predecessor regulations, you know, she grew up in um, rural India in severe poverty. She couldn't even afford shoes when she started running. Um, and so, you know, to say that there's a level playing field between duty and, you know, some of the you know, fabulous Canadian young sprinters we have, I think is, is problematic. Uh, there's significant socioeconomic, environmental um, differences, uh, you know, that affect performance. And so when you're saying um, someone like uh, Duty Chan might have some sort of biological advantage, well, how does that compare? to all the other advantages, biological, nutritional, socioeconomical, and other that, that people in the belt countries have. And so um, to, to pit one against the other, uh, as uh, sports governing bodies have been doing, and to, to just single out the biological piece, and not only the biological piece, the, a single or a specific set of yeah. biological traits is highly problematic, especially when other biological traits are celebrated. And that's, you know, what we say make athletes great. So there's a whole host of um, inconsistencies uh, that, that are, um, that are in, in, our, in my view, quite, quite problematic. Well, the whole idea of fair play, <laughs> a level playing field, yeah, these are things that are thrown about. but we see how complicated they are and how untrue they actually are. Even in just access to facilities through COVID, we see that there's not a level playing field and it depends where you are in the world. And that's just one tiny issue within all of these others. Um, I can't imagine going through what Castro went through with you know, the physical exam, the hormone test, and the full genetic test, then the public scrutiny, and uh, incredibly difficult to go through. So Carlos, were you there as her counsel through that journey? So no, Mark, we, um, we only joined the fight on behalf of Castor in 2018 uh, when she was challenging the latest uh, iteration of the regulations. Um, you know, but we worked closely with uh, her South African council um, who have uh, accompanied her throughout the journey. You know, and, and, and as part of the CAS case, we had to deduce evidence on the profound harm that uh, 
um, that was caused to her by the, regu- the medications she was forced to take. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's not just Castor as well. I mean, um, there's evidence of women around the world who have been subjected to these, uh, these tests, which are extremely intrusive um, and humiliating. Uh, they're, they're um, you know, uh, very clinically um, uh, prescribed by, uh, you know, procedures that, that, that are questionable, uh, to say the least. Um, indeed, the, the World Medical Association has come out uh, essentially urging doctors not to uh, follow these regulations because of the ethical issues around prescribing hormone-reducing medications, not for any on-label use, but rather exclusively for lowering um, testosterone in order to meet some uh, level that's been set by um, the, the governing bodies. So um, the, the harm caused by these regulations just, uh, I think, can't be, um, can't be overstated. Well, and it's so, like, um, it doesn't make sense to dope. You're like, we're against doping in sport, but we're sanctioning doping in order to compete in sport. Like, uh, uh, the whole thing seems upside down. So, Allison, um, there's a, a I guess, a, a inclusion is complicated and there might be some women who feel excluded because of including caster. So can you speak to the complexity of, of that side of the issue? I'll try to. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, I, I empathize with women who are, um, who are competing on the international stage or aspiring to compete on the international stage and who are receiving a narrative from governing bodies that are telling them that one of the people that they're competing against has an unfair advantage. Um, that That's a message that's being shared. And, you know, Madeline Pape, uh, who competed against Castor herself out of Australia and has now pursued uh, you know, a PhD looking at this topic and has become a staunch ally of Castor and others, talks about her studies and her own experience of the conversation on the sidelines, which uh, based on her, her research reflects racism, reflects homophobia, reflects transphobia, and also a lot of sexism mixed in there. This is the environment in which these athletes are competing against Castor. These are the messages that they're receiving from coaches, from trainers, from officials, from their governing body. It must feel really awful in the same way that it would feel to line up against someone that you believe to be doping. But these are fundamentally different things. And I think that we have a lot of work to do to uh, challenge these dominant narratives um, and to educate athletes, coaches, all the people in that environment about uh, what's, what's really happening and about the human rights that underpin all of this. Because it, it really, I think we're being presented with a false dilemma, which is, you know, caster competing and you know everybody else losing by virtue of her even showing up in the race um and caster and others like her being excluded this notion that for women's sport to survive on its own merits and to thrive requires the exclusion of other vulnerable groups uh or or vulnerable women i shouldn't other anybody but vulnerable women within that category i think that that's a false dilemma and i would challenge us as a sport system and as a society to start from a place of inclusion that is that is the principle and the value that we must lead with and to say okay how are we going to make this work how do we ensure that sport up to the very highest levels can include everybody who shows up, uh, you know, <laughs> without violating doping and other unethical things that we know are important to keep out of sport. But how do we create space for everybody to participate? Um, 
I don't have all the answers, but I do think that the, the drive to kind of squash, <laughs> squash this doesn't just resonate throughout sport. You've got to imagine the kids who are, you know, trying to compete in sport, watching Caster's experience and wondering what it might look like for them. You've got to look at the trans kids and think, what does this mean for them? Not to mention people outside of sport where this gives people license in a lot of respects to discriminate and cause harm. And that for me is just a totally unacceptable position to move forward with. Well said. I just have to stop and clap for that. Um, there's a lot to unpack there, so let me start. Um, so in this idea of inclusion in sport is potentially the idea of starting from male, female, gender, is that a mistake out of the gates? I mean, is that in 2020, you know, okay, in, in seven, 1800s, we needed to do that it that way. But now knowing what we know, is that where it begins to kind of maybe go off the rails? Carlos, do you want to take a, a, a kick at that? Yeah, well, Mark, that's a, that's a very tricky question. Um, you know, and I think from, from our perspective, uh, you know, representing Castor and Duty Chand, um, you know, that, that was not the solution that they were looking for. I mean, for them, these are women who have been born women, uh, have been raised as women, who have competed in junior categories as women, who have competed internationally as women their whole lives. So um, they, they really feel uh, that they have, deserve and should be included in the women's category. So that this notion that there should be a third category, um, I think, you know, I, I understand where it's coming from, but um, based on at least my experience in the issue, uh, I don't think at this point in time that would be, uh, you know, an appropriate an appropriate solution. I mean, these are women, and they want to be recognized as women. Allison, I echo Carlos. It's a tricky question. The having a women's category has allowed women's sport to develop uh, and advance on its own merit. Uh, I, I'm not sure that going completely gender neutral, everybody competes against everybody is necessarily the solution. I agree with Carlos that that's not what they're looking for here. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would say that whether you're talking about inclusion of um, athletes like Castor and Duty Chand, whether you're talking about non-binary athletes, whether you're talking about trans athletes, these represent interesting challenges to the, the way we have classified uh, participants and the way that we police those boundaries. I don't know what the answer is, but I do think that it's important that we're talking about this because people representing these communities have existed long before 2020 um, and have been sort of fitting in as they can. I think recognizing though that the way we're organizing things is increasingly out of date is the start. Where we go from here, I can't exactly say other than again, we have to lead with that value of inclusion. And I completely understand Carlos, you know, Castor's um, what, what she would like as an outcome. I, I just also think it's an amazing opportunity to challenge lots of different ways that we look at the world. And I love that the world's become so non-binary from a sexual point of view, sexuality. And I think the same is probably true with, with gender. I don't necessarily say Castor falls into that, but I think it's opening the discussion. Um, which is really hard and it's really fascinating because sport is the last place that wanted to deal with this. We all know that. Like it's like traditional and conservative and rule bound and suddenly it's kind of in a hot seat of how do we deal with, with some of these issues? And, and I guess back to your point, Allison, you know, what are the larger implications of this case for so many people? Carlos, I'll start with you. Yeah, well, I think um, 
you know, I think this this case is certainly um, representative of you know a lot of the challenges we're facing. I mean, you know, I, I keep coming back to um, really two points. One is sort of this notion that women's sport is in danger, um, and that uh, you know women with certain uh, genetic and biological differences are a threat. You know, and I, and I think that is fundamentally flawed. Um, you know, I think women like Castor and like Judy Chand and others are inspirations to uh, women all around the world. They, uh, I think, are actually, um, you know, in, inspiring people to take up sport uh, and to uh, and to stay in sport. So, you know, the, the notion that um, allowing, uh, you know, women uh, with these uh, with these characteristics to compete in the women's category somehow will cause other women to stop competing in sport or to turn to doping, which were allegations made in 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 uh, Castor's case. Uh, you know, as a lawyer, you want to see evidence of that, and there was absolutely none, right? Like. It, from the period 2015 to 2018, these regulations had been set aside by the Court of Arbitration for Sport and they weren't enforced. There's no evidence that in that time women were dropping out of sport because they felt they couldn't compete. There's no evidence that doping increased in that time. You know, I would say that women were being inspired by Castro's performances and perhaps were being, um, you know, uh, compelled to actually to, to participate in sport. So. I think that's um, you know one of the fundamental uh, issues here. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd go to my second point, but maybe I'll, I'll let uh, let Allison uh, have the mic. I just completely agree with everything you're saying, Carlos. And I think so. I'll, I'll maybe talk less about Castor and more about just what this means for women in sport more broadly. Um, I agree that there has been this effort to manage a risk associated with protecting women's sport that where the, the cost of managing that risk seems to outweigh the risk. <laughs> so the medicine is, is worse than, than the, perceived, uh, the perceived illness in this case. What we have is sport bodies de deciding what is an acceptable female body and mandating that and enforcing it. And so you have a lot of women who are, are being scrutinized just because people look at them and say, hmm, she doesn't look womanly enough. She doesn't look like what we expect her to look like based on, as you said, very uh, ethnocentric, sort of affluent white women, heteronormative women, and so on. Men are not subjected to any of this in sport. This is an experience reserved for women. And it effectively reflects a lot of the sexism and misogyny that exists in our larger society where women are told what they should look like, how, how strong they should look or be, how fast they could be. And it really boxes us in and limits the sense of what women are capable of and our, our innate potential. Um, no one looks at men who have dominated in their sport, like Usain Bolt, like Michael Phelps, and says, we should be testing them to determine whether they have some biological advantage and regulate that biological advantage. But we've placed a ceiling and I would say a very arbitrary one based on disputed science. The whole thing is should be really offensive to women. Women who are striving to compete at the highest levels of human potential. It should be offensive to have largely men telling them what the limits of that capability is. And I agree that deciding the, what those limits are based on one single biological characteristic is, it's frankly unsupportable, especially if it comes in direct violation with human rights. And the UNHCR has come out and said that they're deeply concerned about this, uh, among others. So I just feel like sport is working on the wrong side of history with this one. <laughs> 
And I have to say, Allison, the reason this is really interesting on a to us LGBTQI episode is because actually what you were just talking about, I can relate to as a gay man, I, the cult of masculinity, the, the what I had to subscribe to to somehow fit into that same dominated, male dominated subscribed mythology of what it is to actually participate in sports. So I'm glad we're having this because I think many people watching this will feel they may not be women. I think a lot of our women viewers, I hope, are getting great insight because I certainly am. But I, I have a bit of a shared experience there that was a bit of a surprise to me as you were really describing that so well. I think um, the other thing is, as we move beyond, like, I, I love that, Carlos, you have Castor's case and Alice, and you're able to really talk about the, the broader implications. So where does Castor go from here, Carlos? Where are we, like, as of today and, and heading into the Olympics? Yeah, so um, in terms of Castor, uh, you know, she has stated unequivocally that she refuses to take these medications. Um, so what that means is she's essentially been required to move away from her specialty event, the 800 meters. Um, and moved to, to events that aren't regulated by, um, by World Athletics. So she is now um, training and competing in 200 meters and uh, trying to uh, qualify for Tokyo 21 in that event. In terms of the broader sort of legal battle, um, there are uh, several potential options available. I mean, the most obvious one is that the, um, the decision of the Swiss Supreme Court is subject to further appeal to the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. Um, so that is uh, certainly on the table. The other interesting factor about the, um, the caste decision is that it expressly does not deal with the domestic uh, enforcement of these regulations in jurisdictions around the world. So, you know, consider a country like Canada that has very strong um, human rights protections, both both at the federal level and the provincial level. Um, if there is a World Athletics event being held here, um, the question of whether uh, those regulations would be enforceable in Canada is certainly open. Um, and uh, that's uh, one avenue that could be pursued. And the same thing goes for all the countries around the world, for example, South Africa as well, has an extremely strong constitution that, um, that protects, protects human rights. So um, I, I think that the key thing is, is uh, Castor is determined both on the track and off um, to keep fighting uh, for her right to run free. Wow. Allison, I'm going to just put you on the hot spot for a sec because I did a um, 2008 I did a, a documentary on, it was called The Miracle Body. And one of the episodes was on Michael Phelps. <laughs> and it was how he was double jointed on his knees and his ankles and he has the wings spent. Like he had every human advantage to be a successful swimmer. So ironically, like there, there has been scrutiny, but it was celebrated. It was, it was a different tone entirely. So I'll let you pick it up from there. Yeah, when I think about where we go from here, I, I think that we need to reframe the problem. So right now, casters being and others like her are being presented as the problem, a disruption to the orderly nature of sport and people's expectations of how that should move forward. So let's deal with that problem, caster. I would reframe the problem as we have a system that doesn't reflect and respect the true diversity that we now know exists in humanity. And so when we start to look at where the solutions can come from, it's not about how do we contain, contain the disruption over here. It's, it's we have to look at the system. We have to be prepared to have these kinds of conversations, get uncomfortable, think outside the box, learn a lot, um, talk to one another, and imagine what the future could look like. Mm -hmm. um, that's hard work. That's a lot harder than leaving it to one person and an army of volunteer lawyers 
fighting a legal battle over and over and over again, uh, because that's really nice and contained over there. For us to really take a hard look at the system requires us to take a lot of our assumptions and a lot of our norms and to think differently about what it could look like as we move forward. And we know that we're not just doing that for Castor and for Do Teach Chan. We know we're doing that for young people all over the world who are looking to belong and for whom sport can be an incredibly powerful vehicle for that self-actualization. So uh, I'm optimistic, I'm an eternal optimist. <laughs> I'm optimistic that we can do it, but it start it starts with conversations like this. Yeah, and that transformative experience can only happen if you have a space to participate. That's the whole thing. And so it starts from that that overriding issue of inclusion and trying to find that place of acceptance that works for for as many as possible. All actually. <laughs> um, that was great, you guys. I mean it's it's a it, it's a it's not a difficult issue. It's a very, it's a very um, timely issue. I think for many people in our community, um, we've been dealing with so many nuances of sexuality and gender and fluidity that we're a little bit more accustomed to the challenges of some of these discussions because there's so much intersectionality. It isn't the conversation itself isn't black and white. There's so many nuances to it. If you were going to summarize uh, your experience and your time on the show in one word today. <laughs> what would that word be? Allison, I'm going to throw it over to you to start. Invigorating. Oh, that's a great word. Okay, that's awesome. Carlos, over to you. Yeah, I think I'm feeling optimistic, you know, um, hearing Allison's perspective, I think, really, um, really makes me uh, proud as well to be a Canadian. So I think, um, I think that's uh, uh, the values that, that we have, I think, are, are, um, are really phenomenal. And uh, yeah, it's been, it's been a real, real pleasure, Mark. Wow. And I mean, Carlos, you were on Team Canada representing our country in swimming. Now you're standing at that court of arbitration in sport, which I just, I can't get over that. So it's like being at the Supreme Court, right? It's, it's the ultimate. So yeah. congratulations on, on that. It's really great. And I, I would say my one word is, you know, I got a lot of insight really, and, and inspired, Allison, I, I have to echo Carlo's comments. Um, your passion and your logic, I think really helps me understand this issue a lot better. And um, thanks for being part of the show today. Well, thank you. And thank you, Carlos, for, for educating us all on the ins and outs. Uh, we really appreciate that. All right, so now for the formal wrap. So if you want to share your one words, do it in, in the chat box, of course. We love to hear from you. But thanks for coming to the third episode. Um, there's 10, so lots to go. Yay! <laughs> I hope that this uh, session was really helpful and insightful. I, I really know it was for me. There's lots of issues of regulation. I like that we were able to really look at Castor's case specifically. And then, Allison, you could really help us broaden that and look at some of the bigger implications that it has on sport in our community. So thanks again to Carlos Sayo from Tire LLP and to Allison Sandmeyer Graves from Canadian Women and Sport for joining us today and giving their insights to enrich in this conversation. And as for you, the audience, thanks for showing up. <laughs> the next episode is October 7th at 7 p.m. Uh, Mountain, 9 p.m. Eastern. And um, we're gonna be discussing the ways in which mental health and sport intersect. So again, thanks, Allison. Thanks, Carlos. Great show. Good night, everybody. Thanks, Mark. Thanks. Thank you. And thanks to Gal.